Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Keep your Bibles open, if you would, please, there to Hebrews in chapter 10. And I just need to uh, mention a few things with you this morning. I don't know if it was mentioned this morning or not. I, if it was, I missed it. But Awana Closing is on Wednesday night, I believe. And uh, so that will be up here. And I'm going to suggest that we forego prayer meeting and we come and join the Awana Closing on Wednesday night. So keep that in mind, please. And also, uh, I wanted to thank the ladies. Evie's kind of done that, but I, that was a great day yesterday. I wasn't part of it, but... I could hear the noise, the excitement, and to see the parking lot filled, and, and to see all those ladies here was a, a wonderful thing, and thank you. I know ladies came in the day before and spent almost the whole day here getting ready for it, and a lot of the day afterwards cleaning up, and I just want to thank you so much for the effort put into that. And then, uh, this week, many of you already know, was a tragic week for a young couple in our church for Skena and Lyndon, and on Wednesday, uh, after 36 months of carrying little Quentin in her womb, found out that the baby had died. And we have wept with them, and I encourage you to weep with them at their loss. There will be a service here this Wednesday two o'clock in the afternoon for Quentin. And I want to encourage you, if, if possible, I know some of you work and so on, but if you could come and just be there to encourage them. Thank you for those of you that have made contact, those of you who are planning to take meals and so on to help them out. Uh, just want to thank you. It means a lot to this young couple, but keep them before the Lord in your prayers, please. I want to talk to you this morning about the only way to live. And the Bible tells us that four times at least, I think many more times, but one specific phrase that I want us to focus on comes in verse 38 of chapter 10. And the last time we were together in the book of Hebrews, we've been working through it verse by verse. We dealt with this last section, and we talked about the fearful thing that it is to fall into the hands of the living God. We talked about the tremendous testimony of faith that the believers showed in this little church that the author's writing to, and even to the point where they suffered gladly the loss of their personal goods. That's a tough thing to do. Most of us would be very stretched to say, boy, I'm glad it's gone. Uh, we, we would struggle with that. But then he says this to highlight this truth. After he's warned them, by the way, about shrinking, Remember, how many of you remember talking about shrinking, all right? And they tell me when you reach a certain age, you start to shrink, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But there's a way you don't want to shrink. You don't want to shrink in your spiritual life. You don't want to shrink. You don't want to, some translations have it, draw back, fall backwards spiritually. We want to be moving forward. We want to be growing in our walk with God. And with that in mind, the author here, as a pastor, thinking about his little church, 
He says, listen, I want to remind you, the just, those that are justified in the sight of God, shall live. How do we live? How do we live? We live by faith. Skane and Lyndon are going to have to hang on to that this week, aren't they? To live by faith. When the things that you see with your eyes torment and hurt, when they suffer loss, you need the eye of faith to make it through and to live through those difficult moments in your life. The author here in Hebrews 10.38 is quoting from the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, where it was first said, the just shall live by faith. And, and there the prophet Habakkuk was really wrestling with, God, what in the world are you doing? It doesn't make any sense. Yes, I know that Israel is not in a good place spiritually. I know that sin is rampant. But God, how could you even suggest to bring those wicked pagan Babylonians over here to put us into bondage and to carry us into captivity, which is what God had said through the prophets, that's what I'm going to do. God, how can you do that? I, I can't wrap my mind around that. And as he goes through the book and God explains to him why he's doing what he's doing, and then he comes down towards the end of that book and he says, Lord, if we don't have food, if we don't have sheep, we don't have this, we don't have that. It's okay. Why? Because, Lord, we have you. And we believe in you. That's a tremendous statement to make when you're looking at being in captivity for 70 years, isn't it? That, Lord, we're going to trust you. The just shall live by faith. Habakkuk, God says, you have a responsibility. In these dark and difficult and turbulent days, your responsibility before a holy God is to live by faith in the living God. We talked a lot yesterday with Skein and Linda. And I'm sorry if I'm making this too personal this morning. There are questions, aren't there? Why? Why? And I try to explain to them, as Christians, we can't live our lives by explanations. Even if we knew all the reasons and all the explanations for what they have suffered, it would never take away the pain, would it? And the hurt and the difficulty of these moments. What they need to to bear them up, what you're going to need in your life. And some of you here this morning, I know some of you in a battle with cancer. You're going to need to know and hang on to this glorious truth. The just shall live by faith. The things that we put up with on a daily basis, he says, you can't face it, you can't make it through the day unless you live by faith. That's a phrase that's found at least four times in your Bible. It's found in Habakkuk. It's found here in Hebrews. It's found again in Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. It's found in Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. And just laying it out, this basis for faith. And then those verses that we love in Ephesians. <laughs> for by grace are you saved through what? Through faith. Not of yourselves, it's not of anything you're going to attain that live up to, it's not by keeping the laws, it's by faith in what God's Son, Jesus Christ, did on the cross of Calvary, in His death, and as we learned last Sunday morning, His what? His resurrection, because we have a living Savior. You're going to need faith in this truth to make it through the day. So, we're talking about faith. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, as we come here this morning, and I can't speak for everyone, but I know my heart's heavy, I want to pray for Skana and for Lyndon and their family.
Lord, they need your grace today, which is your strength to stand up and bear up under pressure and difficulties and trials. Lord, there are others here today that need that grace as well. Lord, I I think of my Uncle Headley. I, I think of Shawnee Merrill up in the hospital today. I think of Mrs. Moore and others, Lord, that need your grace. They need faith to see you today in the midst of their difficulties. And I pray that you'd help them to come out of these circumstances victorious by faith in the living God. Help them to experience your love. Lord, your presence to comfort, to sustain them, to bear them up. We lift them before your throne. We come to you today as a needy people. I come before you as a needy preacher. Lord, I can't bring forth any truth that's going to help anybody in this place apart from the filling of your precious Holy Spirit. And I'm pleading with you as I I have through the night, as I have this morning. Fill me, Father, that I could share a truth that would comfort and strengthen this entire church, those that gather in this place. And Lord, not just so that we'd be sustained, but so that you would be glorified. That others in the midst of our suffering would see our God. And Lord, be brought to bow before you as their Lord and Savior. I pray that each person that walks out of here this morning will walk out sensing that they have been in the presence of the living God, been touched in their heart and in their spirit by you and by your truth, that we'd walk out of here being a people of faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. How many of you have problems? You know, there's, there's no problem that you have that you face that is not related in some way to faith. How, how many of you have a problem with worry? The honest ones raise their hands. The rest of you are trying to be spiritual. Faith eliminates worry, doesn't it? It, When you think about it, worry is just a mild form of atheism. It's a failure to believe that our sovereign God is able to handle that circumstance, that situation, that thing that I'm facing, that thing that I'm dealing with. When my Bible says that His grace is sufficient, it's enough. And more than enough for every burden that we carry in our lives. Worry seems to be a pandemic in our society. We worry about Trump. We worry about Trudeau. We worry about this. We worry about the terrorists. We worry about everything. It's a lack of faith in God. It's, it's, it's saying that if there's a God at all, I don't know if he can handle my situation, our situation. Worry is faith turned inside out and upside down. And the author of Hebrews is calling this little church to faith. Because if they don't, if they're not growing in their faith, they will be shrinking back. They will be falling away from the living God. There's another problem we face. I talked with people this week said, I am so lonely. I just feel... Like, I don't have a friend in this church. That's what somebody said. That's a sad commentary to have somebody make. But, and I don't belittle that when I say this. If you have faith in God, <clears throat> listen, that faith will make him so real to you, you will never be alone. I am never alone. Because he is always with me. He's promised it, hasn't he? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. When we don't believe that, we're lacking in our faith. 
Some of you this morning may be burdened with guilt. There's something you've done, and it eats away. And you may even have tried at times to seek forgiveness, and, and yet you, don't, you carry the load of guilt with you. And the only reason you can ever carry guilt with you is if you lack the faith to believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is great enough to wash away and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You don't need to walk around with a load of guilt on your shoulders today. It's the good news of the gospel. I thought of another problem we have. Disobedience. How many of you suffer with disobedience? We'll send you to the pastor's office. He has a strap there right after the service. Why, why are we disobedient? Why do we have such trouble obeying the word of God? Listen carefully, because we don't really believe the Word of God. Ever been walking somewhere, maybe down a street, and you see a park bench there, and there's a little sign on it that says, wet paint. You know already what I'm going to say, don't you? What do you have to do? Just got to go <laughs> look around, make sure everybody's looking because we don't believe the word that's on that bench. And the reason we disobey God is because we don't believe the word of God is true. That he tells us what will bless us and what will curse us. And that's why we disobey him. How many of you tithe? Don't raise your hands, please. God says, if you tithe, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, right? But I can guarantee you there's an awful lot of Christians that don't tithe. Why don't people tithe? Because they don't believe the Word of God. Because if you, what, what mother, what father wouldn't want to have the windows of heaven opened? So that God would pour out a blessing. And he says that he will. So if we don't do it, we don't what? Let's say it. We don't believe the word of God. But the just shall live by faith. And faith requires us to believe everything that God says in his word. In his powerful word. In his life-giving word. Believe in the Lord. Now, we're talking about faith, and I'm not going to give you a, a definition of faith this morning. I, I was going to spend some time, but I'm looking at the clock, and I, I won't. I was going to talk about what faith isn't. I was going to tell you about things like faith is not just a blind leap into the dark. I want to tell you it's a step in the light. Faith is is not just the power of positive thinking. It's not just, well, I'm, I'm an optimistic person. That's not what faith is about. I want to talk to you about the nature of faith. And, and you're going to have to have your thinking caps on a little bit this morning. I'm going to warn you, it's a little different than the way I usually preach, but, but I want us to get a hold of this thing called faith. Listen, if faith is the only way to live, and it is, then we better know what faith's about, don't you think? If, if I came down there today, took a microphone, stuck it in your face, said, tell us, what is faith? How many of us really have a good grasp of what faith is? And it's interesting, I can't find anywhere in the Bible a definition of what faith is. I can't. But I found this description of what faith is and what faith does. <clears throat> and look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How many of you would be honest and say, that doesn't help me a whole lot? Oh, well, if you understand that, please come up here because I'm struggling with it. If you've got that all together, I won't need to preach this, right? 
It's the substance of things hoped for. What, what is faith? By the way, it, he says it's, I want you to maybe just circle these words in your Bible there. He says, now faith is the substance. Whatever faith is, it has substance. And then he says here, it's the evidence of things not seen. So faith is substance and faith is evidence. And there's a third thing about faith that you need to get. Look at verse 3. It says, by faith we what? We understand. Faith has something to do with our ability to understand. To understand our world. To understand our God. Requires faith. So substance, evidence. And I thought, understanding. Understanding. That we need before God. The word here, substance. Sub, meaning underneath. I don't know, but in most places where you have a a floor and you see the floor, there's already a what? A subfloor that's underneath that, whether it's concrete and steel or wood or something, but there's a a subfloor that's underneath. And then substance comes from a word stare in that means what? To stand upon. <laughs> so faith is something that's underneath you that you're able to stand on. And I want to encourage you that when the Bible says that we, we ought to walk by faith and not by sight, Right? That what we're walking on, listen, what the Bible tells us here is that we're not walking on eggshells and jello. We're walking on something that has substance, something that has concrete and steel to it, that, that holds it up and is going to support us. You walked in here today and you sat down on your chair. Why'd you do that? Well, you're tired, I guess. I don't know. But I'm guessing you had a little bit of faith that that chair was going to hold underneath you, right? Support you. It was, you, it's like you go to build a house, and the first thing you do when you build a house, what do you have to lay? A foundation. That's what substance is. Substance is the foundation for your whole life. That's why if the just are going to live by faith, it's got to have some substance to it. Something that will support you and buoy you up. Yes, when you're going through the difficult moments of life, we need that in our lives. And, And the author of Hebrews says, we have that. We have that. That guarantee from God. One translation translates this, we have this assurance of things hoped for. That there's so much substance to faith that it allows us to lay hold of the reality of things that we don't yet have. Abraham. God says, I'm going to give you a son. And the Bible says he believed God. But he went 25 years before he ever got the substance, right? But for 25 years, listen, he had the substance because he believed in God. And there was something else God promised him. He promised him a land. Did Abraham ever live in that land? He had one little plot of it somewhere for a burial ground, but that's about all he ever got. But it says this, that Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. How did he look for that city? By faith. And that city that was coming. Listen, we look for that city, don't we? Call it the New Jerusalem, call it heaven, anything you want to call it. But listen, if you have faith today, heaven has substance for you. Heaven is a foundation for your life. Heaven is a substance. Boy. And I'm coming back next week with my steel-toed boots. Let me just, some people look at faith, this this little boy said, faith is believing what you know ain't so. That's not faith. 
Faith is believing in what you know is so, even though you've never seen it with your eyes. But faith has made it so real to you, it's as real as this pulpit. Faith in God. Now, three words to kind of help you understand faith a little bit. Faith begins, I think, up here with an agreement in your mind and, yes, in your heart that what God says is true. It begins to speak to you. I remember as a young kid and growing up in a church that hadn't preached the gospel and then finally hearing the gospel and, and there was this agreement in my head that says, that's true. And even in my heart, I, I'm beginning to what? To believe that this is true, but it wasn't faith yet. It had to be accompanied by an attitude on my part. An attitude that, that comes out of that agreement that what God says is true about my salvation. An attitude that lays hold of that and trusts in what God said as truth. But it's not just an agreement. It's not just an attitude. It must be followed by an action. Where in the darkness of my bedroom... I knelt down beside my bed and by faith began to confess to God that I'm a sinner and that I believe that even though I'm a sinner, He loved me and that Christ died for the ungodly and I was an ungodly man and that He offered me forgiveness and I took the action of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and got up from my knees that night, feeling like a weight had been taken from my shoulders. I know that's a corny phrase, but it still felt good. And it wasn't based on the feeling that I had. It was based on the rock rib truth of the Word of God. And that he had brought me to the place of faith in Jesus Christ. Beginning with agreement, changing my attitude, and an action on my part where I claim Christ as my Lord and Savior. I hope you've had that moment in your life. That time where you've given your heart to the Lord Jesus and your trust and confidence is in him. Faith is substance. That there's something under me which I can stand upon tonight. This truth of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the substance of things that are hoped for. Now, it's, it's not talking about everything that you wished you had and your desires of your heart when it talks about that. He's talking about, what do I hope for? It's what I hope for, something I don't have. Right? But I've been promised by God that it's, it's a coming. It's going to be mine. And faith lay, lets me lay hold of that as if it had already happened. Now, the Bible says the chief hope of the Christian is what? What's the blessed hope? You Bible school students should know this. The blessed hope is that Jesus is coming back. He's going to catch us up to be with himself. That's the glorious hope that I have in Christ. And listen, that's more real to me than this pulpit that stands before me today. This hope of Jesus. It's not... The hope in the Bible is not an uncertain thing. It's not something, maybe it will, maybe it won't. I hope tomorrow I'll do this or that. It's a certain hope, an assurance in my heart that Jesus is coming and I'm going to be with him for all eternity. That's his promise to us. There are a lot of things we hope for. Christ returns, one of them. One of these days I'm going to be glorified. That's one of my hopes. One of these days I'm going to have a home in heaven. That's one of my hopes. And every one of them has what? An absolute assurance that it's going to be true because God's told me that in His Word. 
And God has led me to put my faith in those truths. Then he says this, faith is not just a substance, it's the evidence of things not seen. My wife watches these criminal shows all the time. Because she watches all these shows like Criminal Minds and this kind of stuff, I sleep with one eye open. (laughs) I'm a little afraid she's looking for ideas. But when they catch one of these criminals and they take them into the courtroom and they begin to lay out the what? The evidence. What does the evidence do? They use the evidence to to bring conviction of those criminals. In the spiritual realm, God uses the evidence that comes from His Word to bring conviction to our hearts and lives. Because of the evidence of truth I see in the Word of God, it brings convictions into my heart that it's easy to say, but I believe it's true, I'd be willing to die for. We we need people today with convictions. And by the way, the whole 11th chapter that we're going to be spending some time in going through here and a series within a series on Faith Hall of Fame, we're calling it. He gives example after example after example of those that had convictions in their heart. Not just a confidence because of the substance, but now a conviction within the heart. Right? That these things are so. Conviction about things that, what is it? Things that you can't, you can't see. God's given these wonderful, marvelous convictions to us. You know what the world says? Seeing is believing. Do you know what Jesus said to Thomas? He said, Thomas, you know what? You believe because you've seen, but blessed are those that what? Haven't seen, but believe. And the truth of the Word of God, listen, the only way that you can truly see God and see the things that He's promised, the only way is by first believing. And not until you believe can you really see. See that God's behind creation. See that that God's behind your life, the fact that you're here on this planet. See that God's behind the will and purpose and direction for which we've been placed here. I think I wrote in the outline somewhere, the Christian ought to be living above sea level. Above what you can see with your eyes. We need to be living. The just shall live by what? By faith. Faith in the living God. Colossians tells us, chapter 1 and verse 16, that Jesus created all things, visible and invisible, seen and invisible unseen. He did it all. All of these things he accomplished, and he accomplished for us. Look at verse 3 here. It says, by faith we understand. What is it we understand? We understand that the worlds, not just world, but what? Worlds. All these planets and stars and the universe in which we live He says, we understand that the worlds were framed by what? By the Word of God. Where's he he going with this? Where's where's he taking us today with with these truths? Uh, I stuck something in my notes here, and I just want to go find it for you for a minute. (laughs) Faith opens our minds to the understanding of the cosmos. Have you ever thought about the cosmos? It's staggering in size and glory. Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, do you know how far away it is? 25 million miles away within our little galaxy. 
our glorious sun that fills the sky. We see it every once in a while. It is but a mere speck in our galaxy. There's a huge star in our galaxy called, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, Betelgeuse. Have I got it right, Sarah? She's rolling her eyes at me. B-E-T-E-L-G-E-U-S-E. If you can say it any better, good for you. (laughs) This star is so big. Listen, it's 27 million times larger than our sun. It would take 14, 25 million mile trips to travel around the diameter of that largest planet or star. Our galaxy, by the way, is only one of 100,000 million other galaxies. It's amazing. I look at that, and the only thing I want to do is I just want to praise God. But we live in a world where some people look at that, and they want to figure out, how this works, because they don't want to believe in God. And they want to talk about things, well, you know, th- there was this big bang. Have you realized this, that everybody in this world has faith? I have faith that God spoke, because it says so in Genesis chapter 1, and brought all things into existence. They have faith that a big bang took place, wherever that came from, and wherever there was anything to have a big bang with came from, and all this came into existence. Somebody says to me, Pastor, would you please prove to me that there's a God? Sorry, Mike, I can't. Mike Smith, stupid pastor. I got them. Now, just a minute, Mike. Prove to me there's no God. Because you know what? There's no scientist on this planet that's able to prove there's no God. None. And I can't go into all the stuff about creation this morning. You'll appreciate that because that way you'll get dinner sometime today. I read a story this week about a group of mice that lived in the piano. You didn't know that when you played that today, did you? And inside that piano, they, they, from time to time, would hear this beautiful music and the sounds, but they never knew where it was coming from. They were deep down inside. One day, one of those mice got brave, and he went up, and he came back and said, you know what? I figured out where the sound comes from. There's these strings in there, metal strings, and and they're shorter and longer, and they vibrate, and that's where it's coming from. And and up to that point, these little mice have been worshiping the player. The player. And he said, we don't need to worship the player anymore. I've figured out where the sound comes from. It's the string. And so they began, except for the most conservative ones, to not worship the player any longer. And then another mouse got a little more brave, and he went out, and he came back with the great news. I've discovered it's not just the strings. There's these hammers that go up and down, and they make the sound. You're right, we don't need to worship the player anymore. Well, we've figured it all out with our scientific minds. We've made it a matter of just mathematics. And isn't that what we've done in our world? I want you to know tonight, today, this morning, you're scared because you think I'm going to keep you here until tonight. I want you to understand there's a player and his name is God. And he created it all. Now, I'm going to have to cut this short, but I, want, I don't want you to walk out of here without this. He says, I want you to understand this. 
that all these things were created, seen and unseen, by what? By the Word of God. And by the way, you know what was here first? He says the things that were made were not made of things that were, but of things that were unseen. What's the unseen? That's the invisible world. And the invisible world was here first. We tend to think this world that here that we see, this is the real world. This pulpit and what it's made of, this floor, these walls, that's the real world. But this book says that all of these things were made out of the things that were unseen. The invisible things. And isn't it interesting? If I told that to my great-great-grandpappy, he'd have laughed himself silly and wrapped me up in a straitjacket. But we know that this thing is made out of that which is unseen. You can't see an atom with your naked eye, and it's made up of these little electrical things like protons and so on, right? Right? Long before we discovered any of this, this book said that our God in heaven spoke through his word and brought it into existence. And the important thing that you understand, if God could do this through his word, listen. What situation in your life could that God not overcome? What do we want in this world? I want peace. And so my circumstances right now, I don't have that peace in my heart, but... You know what? If I'll have faith in this God who spoke and brought the worlds out of nothing, ex nihilo, into existence, it's not a big stretch for me to have faith that that God can give me peace in the midst of the most difficult situations in this world. And you think whatever your problem is today, faith enables you to say that this God who could speak and out of nothing. See, he takes it right back to Genesis chapter 1 here and begins with God who what? Who spoke and through his revelation brought it all into existence. That God, he says, is the God that can see you, these Hebrew Christians that were facing persecution for their faith, that were suffering the loss of their goods, that some were being imprisoned. They could endure that because they knew that the God that could speak and bring something out of nothing, not just something, but everything out of nothing, I can trust Him. I can trust Him. I can have faith in this living God and all that He's done for me. Do you believe in God? Do you know there's a trucking company down in Georgia. I was reading about it this week. That if you're going to work for them, you have to take a lie detector test. And I don't know if it's a Christian that runs it or not, but one of the questions that they ask is, do you believe in God? Do you know what they discovered? That 100% of people, and a lot of them says, no, I don't believe in God, They were proved to be liars because the lie detector picked it up and said, they believe in God. Why? Jesus says that except you believe as a what? A little child. Do you ever notice how easy it is for a little child to believe in God? When you're in a one and you're talking to these kids, do they believe in God? You have a Sunday school class, they believe in God. You start talking to them about God, they seem to get it. I'm reminded of the atheist son that came to his dad one day and says, Dad, do you think that God knows that we don't believe in him? Listen, the most natural thing in the world is to believe in God. Because he made it that way. God made it that way. And not to believe in God is not a matter of the head. That's what the intellectuals want to tell us. You know what the Bible says? It gives a half verse to it. Psalm 53 says, the fool has said where? In his heart. 
in his heart, he's chosen not to believe in God. And it isn't that he doesn't believe in God. It just really says, the fool has said in his heart, no God for me. It's like you came to my house today and we're sitting down to eat a meal and I put the potatoes in front of you and you say, no potatoes for me. The world has said, no God for me. I don't want them. But deep down in their heart, they what? They know God exists. They know He exists. They may not know what we know about Him. They may not understand everything we know about Him, but they know something about God. And it's so absolutely important that we know things about God. And and I'm trying to wrap this up honestly. (laughs) Why? Because He says here in verse 6, very, very clearly, without faith, it is impossible to do something. What is it? To please God. And I don't know about you, but when I stand before Him, I want to please God. And I stand before Him this morning, and I want to please God by being a man of faith. I want to please Him this morning by leading you to be a people of faith in the living God that walk through this world with a substance under your feet of concrete and steel. It's so real, this faith that you have. And you've taken in because your understanding's been opened. The evidence of things that are unseen, that our God's God. He's to be worshipped, and He's to be loved, and He's to be served. It's necessary. Faith is so important because it's necessary to understanding the world around us, understanding the will and purpose for my life. It's necessary if I'm going to please God. And I want to, I wish I had time to get into this. Faith is so important because it's, it's, Faith isn't about what God can or will do for you. Faith is in the character of who God is. In a God who can speak and bring it into existence. Why do you think it is that when Jesus came into this world, the Bible says that he laid aside his what? His glory. And he came in a human body, And even that body, you know what it says about that body? He wasn't much to look at. There was no comeliness in him that would have attracted us to him. Why? Because God didn't want us attracted to those things. You know what God wanted us attracted to? To his character. That he's a God that loves us. And we'll talk about that in tonight's service. That he's a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And Jesus did everything in his power. Even when he did a miracle... What did he say so often? Don't go tell anybody. Why? Because it wasn't about the display of his glory. It was the character of God that he wanted people to be drawn to. Who he is. There's a place in the Old Testament where a certain guy comes along and a man named Jehonadab's there and the guy in the chariot says to him, Is your heart right as my heart is with your heart? And he says, yes. And it says the guy reached down, took him by the hand, and pulled him into the chariot with him. There's a God in heaven tonight, today, that's saying, is your heart right with my heart? Are you in agreement with who God is and his greatness and his majesty and his character? Are you in agreement that he's a God of love? Are you in agreement that He's a God of grace? Are you in agreement that He sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life? He says to you this morning, is your heart right with my heart? And if it is, you know what that God does? He just reaches down, says, come on up into the chariot with me. And we'll travel through this old world, and when this world is over and done with, (laughs) you're going to come... And not visit me, but be with me in heaven for eternity, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. And it's all possible because of one thing that God gives to us, and that's called faith. Something with substance, something built upon evidence, to believe in this holy God. Is your heart right with God? See, when my my eyes right, it responds to that light. When my ears are right, they respond to sound. When my heart is right, 
It responds to God. Have you responded to God's offer of salvation in His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and putting your trust in Him? Are you trusting Him today with the circumstances that you're facing in your life? You see, He has a destination for all of this, doesn't He? He's going to tell us when we get into chapter 12 that we're in a race, and a race is a journey. You're going somewhere. But the only way you get from here to there is by faith in God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Acknowledging that you are a sinner, for all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Embracing Jesus by faith. Believing that God demonstrated His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us on that cross, and then rose again. The Bible says for our justification, so that we can be made just and have a righteous standing before a holy God. Do you have that righteous standing this morning? Do you have this sure subfloor foundation underneath you upon which you stand that says with rejoicing, and you know what you know that you know in your heart that these things are written that you may know that you have what? Eternal life. You haven't? Have you put your faith? The kind of faith we've talked about this morning in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. The good folk from MBBI, Redeemed, are going to come, and they're going to sing an invitation song, I believe. I'm going to slip down here to the front. And if you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, there wouldn't be a better morning for you to do that than this morning. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. We're going to stand as they sing this morning. If God has spoken to your heart, Please don't walk out that door without knowing that your sins are forgiven. You have a home guaranteed eternal in the heavens because of the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Come to Jesus, please.